Um, so I will be asking you uh, this question very often. Are you ready? And to answer this question, all you need to do is type R. Okay, so when I ask you, are you ready, type R. You can type Y for yes and N for no. Okay, to make it uh, nice and quick and you don't have to waste your time writing full words. Okay, so uh, this tells me that you are ready. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to say is that this class was born about eight years ago when I took the test, uh, the IELTS test myself. Um, being a teacher of English um, in uh, London um, and I'd been a teacher in London for about seven years then and I had to take the test and I had to score nine um, so when I prepared for the test I did my best to um, to basically uh, do it as well as I could and you know all my fellow teachers were watching me and waiting for my results and so, <laughs> no pressure. Um, so basically, I worked out um, a method. Um, I tried and tested everything that I found on the internet. And if something didn't work, um, I found a new method and I tried it and I tried uh, something again and again until I found the most optimal way of doing this. So what I'm sharing with you is my experience um, as an English teacher taking the IELTS test. So I will be sharing with you something that worked for me and worked has worked for many, many students since then. So this class was first taught face to face. Um, sometimes I would have 40, even 60 students in the classroom. We had to have a big classroom for this. Um, and for a, a few years now, I've been teaching this class online so that uh, different students from different uh, cities can join us. So this brings me to my first question. Could you tell me where you are right now, what IELTS score you need, and if you're doing general training or academics? So for example, London, uh, 7.5, and academic. So something like that. I am in Northwest London, by the way, so hello. <laughs> Eileen, my lovely Eileen. It's a beautiful place to live. <laughs> Okay. Ooh. Many London candidates. Nice. All right. Very strong group tonight. Hampstead. We are neighbors, Louis. <laughs> okay, so everyone is doing academic. Is anyone there who didn't hear my question and is doing general training? Any general training candidates here? Someone's typing, so I'll wait. Where's my phone? That's interesting. Got it. Okay, guys. Um, I would, Angelo, please don't record it. If you 
could not record it, that would be absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, Angela. Thank you. Um, I hope that the um, the materials that I send you, Angelo, will help you remember what happened in the class and will help you revise it. I would prefer for you not to record it and if you're still tempted, at least not to give it to anyone. Um, okay. All right, um, so let's start here. So apart from m my experience of taking the test, I am, well, I, I basically wanted to make sure that I'm not delusional in any way or that my experience wasn't something um, unique. And so uh, while preparing this class, I also asked some questions to other, to IELTS examiners, clerical markers, uh, teachers, teacher trainers, um, course book authors, invigilators and administrators working our, our, at our centre. So basically I asked everyone I could to give me some advice um, and that I could share with, uh, with you guys, with IELTS candidates. So this will be a combination of those. So it is a brief presentation with some practice of the whole IELTS test. Um, if you haven't done any research on IELTS, you will soon find out that it's quite a complex test and it's not easy. And so um, I will do my best to give you uh, the best and the most important tips for the test. We will have a look at, let's say, typical questions. And also I will tell, we will have some practice and I will tell you how to tackle them. This is a great introduction to IELTS. I have had many students who have never taken the test before. And after this class, they were feeling much more confident knowing what the test really is about. It's a great revision before the test if you have been studying for it, especially on your own, using online materials and you want to check if you're on the right track. It's meant for three hours. We have three hours now uh, precisely. Uh, so um, this you're getting a really, really good feel of what the test is like. So we are going to talk about all four skills. This class is not your English language teacher. So I hope you understand that the IELTS test is a language test. It may seem it's like uh, something easy like mathematics. Oh, I scored 6.5 in the previous test, um, piece of cake to take it to seven. It's not so easy actually, because at the end of the day, you are being tested on your language skills and those take time to acquire. So uh, please bear that in mind and don't get frustrated with yourselves. You're doing the best you can and it may happen that you need to practice a little bit more. So please uh, don't fight reality. Um, remember that um, this is not your full IELTS preparation course. I will be teaching a series of master classes next week. Um, and that, um, again, is not your full IELTS uh, course. Um, if I design courses for language schools, um, those courses are at least 30 hours um, in a week or two um, and even four or eight weeks. So that's a lot of classroom time. So uh, please be gentle with yourselves. I will probably fry your brains tonight a little bit. Um, and yet it is not your full IELTS course. Um, <clears throat> so on the menu for tonight we have Tips for all four tests. And these are just approximate timings. Usually reading takes us at least 70 minutes and writing uh, about 70. Um, we will not have general training uh, components. So that gives us at least uh, five, seven minutes extra uh, to discuss uh, task two and task one academic in more depth. 
Um, speaking is about 15 minutes and um, listening about 25 usually shorter, um, but um, we concentrate on reading and writing because these are the skills that most of the students want to tackle. So uh, would you agree that reading and writing are the most difficult parts of the test? Okay, Angelo, you'll have some brilliant uh, listening practice in the email from me. Thank you, Vino. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Victoria, V team. <laughs> okay, so let's do it. The first we are going to talk about is reading. I believe that reading is the master skill of IELTS. If you understand reading, somehow everything else falls into place. It's much easier to do your writing because if you know how people write, you know how to write yourself. I mean, you have a better picture there. So that's why we start with reading. It helps you understand how texts are organized. So hopefully you will organize your essay a little bit better. And also it will help you organize even your speech for uh, the speaking test part too. Um, reading will also be useful when listening. So Vinov and, no, sorry, Victoria and Angelo, you will be using the reading skills to help you um, prepare better for the listening when you read your questions uh, before the listening. Well, everyone really. So, in the academic test, we have three texts which are hellishly long and complex and difficult, and we have 60 minutes to do that. Uh, with 60 minutes and 40 questions, the maths is quite simple. You have one minute and 30 seconds per question. Uh, it may seem like very little, but uh, what you're going to learn tonight will help you uh, answer the questions much faster. Recently, I had a student uh, practicing with me one-to-one -one, and I, as he did his reading exercises, I actually used the timer and he was answering most of the questions in 30, 45 seconds. So it's not that scary. It's not as scary as you think. So what do we do to make it work? We need reading strategies and here I can tell you that IELTS reading test is not a reading test, it's a skimming and scanning test. So if you don't know how to skim and scan, if you don't know how to do it well, um, I presume you will have a lot of problems with the test. So what are they and how do we do that? We will practice together in a sec, so let's see. Um, skimming is looking for the bigger picture, the so-called bigger picture. Uh, scanning is looking for information or keywords. Um, as you can see, both descriptions of these strategies do not include the word read. They are actually about searching. And it's a very, very interesting and very useful way of looking at reading. So. Um, what you're going to do tonight will probably be a little bit of a revolution for you. And once you do it and once you learn it, nobody will take it away from you. This is a life skill. You will be able to use it in the IELTS test and not only. So for both strategies, um, it may seem crazy, but actually it's true. You don't have to read everything and you don't need to understand every word. It's brilliant how it works. Um, skimming, another good news is that you do it every day. You skim every day, for example, when you want to read a um, newspaper. Um, 
first you look at the title and then probably you read the introduction to the article. If you like what you're reading from the introduction, you will carry on. If not, you'll probably find another article and try the technique again to find something that you like. Um, you also scan every day. Maybe not every day you go uh, somewhere by train uh, from Victoria Station, as here in the picture. Um, but it does, uh, you do, 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 you can do that. And you do that not even knowing that you do. So um, if I want to go to Brighton from Victoria um, and I want to find my platform for my train, I will not read the information about all the trains, right? I will find Brighton and then I will read information about it. So this, in short, is like the best way for me to explain to you how scanning works. And um, it's precisely for that reason that you will be scanning uh, in the IELTS test. You will be just searching for the information that you need. Okay, and I think that's quite a revolution in itself. Um, first, we will learn how to do skimming. And in order to do skimming well, you need to understand how texts work. So here is the text. So uh, we'll start with the biggest chunk uh, or uh, the macro scale. So on the macro scale you have a book and when you read the first chapter you decide whether you like, you want to read the whole book or not. Um, if you want to see how the book ended, because for example you want to cheat in your literature classes, you will go straight to the last chapter, right? And uh, there you will find out how the story ended, who died, who got married, who lived happily ever after, yes? So um, if you uh, want to cheat, you will just read the first and the last chapter and this is how you will know what's happened in the book. On a smaller scale, you have an, uh, you have an article. So in an article, again, if you want to find out what the article will be about, if it contains the information that you need, you will read the introduction. And then if you want to cheat again and you want to see the conclusions and uh, recommendations, whatever the writer arrived at, you will simply go to the conclusion straight away. Now, the magic happens here. Just like with the first chapter and the introduction, if you think about a paragraph as a tiny text, then the same happens in the paragraphs on this smaller scale. So usually the first uh, sentence of the paragraph will be its introduction and the last, par the last sentence of the paragraph will serve as its conclusion. Now, this knowledge is crucial to our success with IELTS. This knowledge is crucial to understanding how texts work and this is going to change your life forever, I can guarantee. Um, so, how do we do skimming? Before we do that, I want to show you um, two cases where paragraphs are not your typical paragraphs, when they don't have that first sentence as the um, introduction and the last sentence as its conclusion. Because they are the smallest units, they have the most variety. Um, so the first situation is when uh, two paragraphs and two par paragraphs are units of text uh, which talk about the different things, right? So um, when you have two paragraphs and the writer finds something that connects the ideas from both paragraphs and to make the transition between the two paragraphs smoother and between the two topics, they will write what I call a bridge sentence and the bridge sentence will combine the idea from the first paragraph with the idea from the second paragraph. So the first sentence will not be the main idea of the second paragraph. You will find it right below um, usually. So this is how 
uh, writers make things interesting. And this is something that you need to be aware of uh, as an IELTS candidate because IELTS texts are very well written texts. They are never random. Um, so that's something you can trust. Um, the second situation is when a paragraph starts with a lot of examples, a lot of what I call blah, blah, blah. So um, you can't quite put your finger on it. You kind of know what it is about, but it's like mm, you, you cannot like name it with one word. It's probably because um, the main idea of that paragraph is at the bottom of it. So basically what they do, they um, find a lot of examples, a lot of uh, illustration, let's say, and to surprise you as a reader or to keep you interested or challenged as a reader, they will give you that main idea at the bottom of it. So these are the two cases where your introduction to a paragraph is not the first sentence. Okay, that main idea of the paragraph is not the first sentence. So especially for those of you guys who are aiming for 7.5, this is very, very, very important. So now what we're going to do, we're going to practice some speedy skimming and first I'm sure I will show you how to do it. So we have our text again. <clears throat> and here basically in order to do speedy skimming, and this is the first thing you're going to do as you start your test. So I presume that because you are high level candidates, most of you start the test by reading the questions first. This is a common strategy that a high level candidates believe guarantees success. And I dare to disagree. Uh, when you read the questions first, you give your brain a little bit of a shock, a little bit of a whack. Uh, it doesn't know the text yet. And then you could tell me, okay, Amelia, but when I read the questions, I will find out what the text is about. Well, uh, you will a little bit, but your brain will be super confused because if you read headings first, they are not in order. And a lot of them do not match the content of the text anyway. If you read, for example, true, false, not given questions, again, um, what if they are false or not given? You will not know exactly what's happening in the text, right? So what to do to give your brain what it needs? And your brain really likes to have structure and understanding, right? So what we do, as soon as you open the booklet, don't look at the questions. Don't stress your poor brain out, okay? It's like giving yourself a test without preparation for the test. Right? You don't want to do that to your beautiful brain. Um, so instead, I am inviting you to try this method and read the whole of the introduction first and then the first lines of each paragraph and then the conclusion. In the IELTS test, it will take you no more than three minutes. And this is a really good investment of your time. You, must, you might say, Emilia, but I will be um, wasting this time um, I, sh I could uh, answer two questions uh, in those three minutes. Yes, but after you speedy skim, your brain will know the text and it will calm down and it will collaborate with you, I guarantee. And the result of that collaboration and of that clarity that you have after skimming is that you can answer your questions within seconds instead of one and a half minutes. Um, so, when you skim, you move your eyes, you glide your eyes through the text from left to right and you start with the title. If you're lucky to have one, subtitle, then the whole of introduction and then the first line of each paragraph and then the conclusion. So, as you do that, you ask yourself just one question. What is this text about? or what is this paragraph about? These are not questions from your test. This is only for you and for your beautiful brain. 
Um, you don't have to write these things down. And by the way, you are doing it not because I tell you, but because you want to know what the text is about. Okay, so this is the only thing you concentrate on. I call it the bigger picture. Yeah, what is this text about? You ignore all the details inside the text. You're just finding out what the text is about from the introduction. And then by reading the first lines of each paragraph, you know how information is distributed in the text. You know the map of the text. So let's practice. And I have my first question for you. Um, how many benefits of going digital are there? You're going to read a very short text about libraries going digital. Um, and to help you do your skimming well so that you don't cheat or you don't get lost in details and in the content of the paragraphs, I conveniently cover them with these black boxes. So all you're going to see is just the first lines. I call it cream, like the best stuff is always on top. Yes, just like you find cream in the milk on top. So when you skim, skimmed milk, that sounds familiar, right? You just take care of the cream. So here we are, and you have 15 seconds to answer this question. How many benefits of going digital are there? Go for it. All right. So your answer is here. If you now you're finding out what it is that you're looking for and what it feels like to do skimming. You're looking for the most important information and you're always looking for it at the top of things. Okay, so here is your answer. And if you want, you have a confirmation in the last paragraph. Yes, they are counting one, two, three. So now I have another task for you. And my next question is, what are the three benefits of going digital? And here, I want you to answer uh, with one word for benefit. Please type them all in one line. So, for example, you will write benefit, benefit one, benefit two, and so on, okay? One word for each benefit. Okay, you don't have to write benefit, just write three words, the, the answers, okay? Okay, for this task, you have 30 seconds, go for it.
Lynn, uh, please re listen to instructions carefully, okay? Uh, Lynn Joel Joanne, I asked one word for each. Yes, Angelo, you're doing too much. Lynn, you're doing too much. It's not about copying sentences from the text, okay? So please be careful, pay attention to the instructions, don't apologize. This is a very good lesson to have before the test, okay? Uh, you waste a lot of time and for those answers you will not get any points because if they say one word, if you write two words, you're not getting any points, yes? So very well done everybody. The first benefit is preservation. The second benefit is convenience. And the first one, and the last one, sorry, the third one is space. So here, um, I really love the third one because it shows you how to actually look for content. You have quite a lot of words and the answer is only uh, as the last word of the second line. So you need to go through quite a lot to find it. But if you think about it, it's not electronic copies. It's not advantage. It's not occupy. It's not millimeters. You're finding, you're looking there for something that gives you the most content, right? So I, um, I think I didn't promise to show you, but actually here we have a bridge sentence. So pay attention now and have a look at the sentence highlighted in yellow. Librarians see three clear benefits to going digital. Now, this is a bridge sentence. Why? Because the paragraph before this one is telling you about how libraries are going digital. Yes? It says, all over the world, libraries have be began the task of making faithful digital copies of the books. So this is the idea from the first paragraph. In the second paragraph, as you can see, they are giving you the first of the benefits. And the first of the benefits is preservation. So what they did in that bridge sentence, they combined the idea of going digital with benefits. So now you know that libraries are going digital and also that this um, task uh, or this um, activity is beneficial, right? So this is your bridge sentence. Can you see it? Do you have any questions, anyone? Okay. So you will find them from time to time and they will be, uh-huh, it is. <laughs> um, I do IELTS reading tests instead of Sudoku, Louis. Uh, <laughs> much more challenging and much more rewarding, I think, to do. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, let's move on. And now I will show you how to apply skimming to matching headings to paragraphs. Now, if you think that matching headings is the most horrible question in IELTS, apart from true, false, not given, it's probably because you don't understand the idea behind it. Also, you don't have a strategy to do it. And we hate things we don't understand, right? So to, tonight, I hope this question will become one of your favorites. Um, and the secret to it is very, very simple. So here I've taken a paragraph from the text. It's the first one uh, about libraries going digital and what it means. And here I have six uh, headings for you to choose from. Only one will match this paragraph. Now you have 30 seconds to match this heading, the best heading to this paragraph. And here, I also want to tell you that this paragraph is not your typical paragraph. You have only two sentences here. So you are not doing your mechanical skimming. 
technical and mechanical. Oh, I'll just read the first line and the last line and I will know everything. Here you are concentrating on finding the bigger picture. So the main idea, you will need to find a way to extract this, to think like, so what is this text about? So half a minute, off you go. Very well done, everybody. Um, let's talk about clues here. So basically, I will show you how the traps in IELTS um, headings uh, happen. And the main idea here is to find the bigger picture, the main big idea of the paragraph. In other words, you are looking for the best description of what the paragraph is about. And the trap is, if you don't know what this whole game is about, you might probably start looking at the keywords and thinking that this is what you need to do. So, Victoria, listen up. So, here we have Herculean and books in the first lines. And you think, oh my God, this must be it. But if you have a quick look through this text, you realize that this, that this text is not about Hercules and books. So here you are learning the main distinction between things that are mentioned in the text and what the text is about. So just because they mention Hercules, it doesn't mean that the text is about him, right? Then we have all over the world libraries. Now, this I think was quite a tempting um, heading for this paragraph. The only thing we need to understand here is that if this text was about libraries all over the world, it would probably go like this. 
Libraries in Europe, blah, 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 um, are different to libraries in America. However, libraries in Asia and libraries in um, Australia, da, 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 da. Yes, nothing like this ha is happening here. So again, if you gave this text to somebody and said, here is your text, the title is libraries all over the world, they would be really disappointed, right? Um, so your heading for the paragraph is like a title for a text. It gives you a really, really good idea of what will be inside of it, what the text is about. Another example, we have humankind and intellectual. Now, is this text about humans as, humans as intellectuals? No, just because they are mentioned there, it doesn't mean that the text is about them, right? Another uh, funny example, wealth of information. And you might think, oh, um, it's about how information makes you rich. If you give this text to your friend and say, here you go, you will learn how to get rich on information, your friend will be very disappointed. Uh, we also have amateurs and the internet mentioned in the text. Is this text about amateurs and the internet? Obviously not. So the only and the best heading you could find here is six. Yes. So this is how I, I created this exercise to help you feel and understand what the difference is. Yes. So in the IELTS test, you always have more headings than you need. And what they do is they will try to fool you. They will try to confuse you by giving you those little keywords from inside the text to make you think that those are the headings, that this is what you're looking for. And if so, you as you understand that it's about finding titles for the texts, yes? So headings are mini titles for mini texts. Um, you're, you're always going to do it well, yeah? So you're looking for the main idea in the paragraph. So either you will do it just by reading the first and the last lines, but if you're not getting that sense of, mm, now I know what it is about, you basically need to apply, for example, this strategy. You're simply looking for the bigger picture. Also, from my experience, if the paragraph is um, if the paragraph is very long, you might have to read uh, two or even three lines. If the paragraph is short, you might have to read either the first line and it will be enough, or everything, just like here. So, um, don't do it mechanically, yes, you need to do it in order to get that information, not because I told you to read the first or the, or the last line. So, you'll need to practice this and get a feel of it yourself. How to check? Well, before you apply a heading to a paragraph, you can obviously ask yourself this question. If this paragraph is about one idea, what is it about? What is this paragraph about? If I were to cheat again and tell my friend within like two minutes what the text is about so that they don't um, get a bad score, uh, you will tell them, libraries are going digital, good thing, right? Um, instead of telling them Hercules and books or amateurs and the internet, yes? Um, now, if you apply a heading already and you have another paragraph that looks very similar or you have another heading that is confusing you and looks very similar to the other one, you can test it. So, for example, if I say, is this paragraph really about how information makes us rich? Can I see the proof? And I will not find it. Uh, apart from just saying, saying, oh, I have the keywords, right? Wealth and information. This text is not about that. Yes? If I want to find out 
about libraries all over the world. I will not find this information in this paragraph, right? So it's the same thing. You need to just ask yourself quickly, what is it about? Is it really about that? And then see again if, if this makes sense. Yes, if that heading really matches the paragraph. Why do I have pink elephants here? Um, well, whoop. I have a very short improvised text about pink elephants. It goes like this. Pink elephants are pink because they eat roses. They live in Antarctica because they hate uh, heat and they really love really cold weather. They have one child in their entire life and they only live until, until they are 33 years old. Now, is this paragraph about Antarctica? Is this paragraph about roses? <laughs> no, it is about pink elephants, right? So this is how you uh, recognize the bigger picture and you do not allow the keywords to fool you, yes? So I still have students who studied this class with me, for example, two years ago, and they write to me like, Emilia, I still remember your pink elephants. They really helped me. <laughs> um, so um, think pink elephants and you will never get your headings wrong. So now I want to summarize this and I want to show you the parallel between the text and the paragraph. So you have a text and its uh, introduction, conclusion, and uh, obviously the title. Uh, with the heading, you have a mini text and that mini text has a mini introduction and a mini conclusion that gives you the mini title. I wholeheartedly encourage you all to now, until your test, test yourselves and every time you open that practice book, test IELTS test number 10 or 12 or 9, you can do all your tests again using this technique and see how differently you, you see everything. And basically, before you even look at the questions, forget about them, okay? And first, skim, speedy skim the text. See what it is about, yes? Just read the first lines of each paragraph plus introduction and conclusion and think, hmm, what is it about? Ah. Now I know, your brain will go, we can do the questions now, okay? So, now that we've done skimming of the text about libraries, and we know that the first paragraph is about libraries going digital, the second about the first benefit, convenience, oh no, preservation, and the second one about convenience, and the third one about space, now we can tackle the questions. So, in order to do questions well in IELTS, you need to master the uh, technique of scanning. So, after you skim your text, you know what it is about, yes? Your brain has the structure and the mental map of the text. So, you will also be um, better equipped to find the keywords more quickly. In other words, you will know which paragraph is likely to contain the keyword that you're looking for. So you're looking for keywords, phrases, or their synonyms. The rest will be completely invisible to you. So there are three ways of doing this. And you might be a little bit shocked because we will be doing it differently to how we read. We will do it differently to how we read because we want to use our full brain capacity to find the keywords. We don't want to understand anything because that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and it slows us down. So, with scanning, 
we are doing the opposite to what to how we read so in english we read from left to right and top to bottom when you scan and when you just want to find keywords you will go in the opposite direction so you will go from the right bottom corner of the paragraph to the top left corner of it okay and as you do you will simply your eyes will find the keywords for you you're like a scanner <laughs> Angelo is shocked <laughs> um, I'll tell you something guys if you're still thinking that IELTS is making your life difficult I would like you to stop for a, for a second and see how IELTS is actually helping you if you are about to start your studies in English or um, register as a doctor or as a nurse here you do a lot of CPD, right? You, lo you do a lot of study. They are, by making this test the way it is, they are inviting you to learn the strategies to cope with that. I remember when I went to uni, I cried the first year. They told me to read 10, 15 books a week. And I cried because I was like, but you're asking me to do impossible thing. And maybe I'm too stupid. Maybe other people can read 10 or 15 books a week. I cannot. And I didn't know about skimming and scanning then. So you, thanks to IELTS, have an opportunity to learn how to cope with a lot of text and how to find your answers and the information that you need quickly okay i did it intuitively at uni and it cost me a lot of time and a lot of tears um so now you have a very easy version of it you're welcome <laughs> um so we will go from right to left and bottom to top this is to prevent you welcome victoria uh, this is to prevent your brain from reading and trying to understand so this is the the base yes from right bottom corner to left top corner if a paragraph is wider from one edge of the paper to the next then I advise you to do zigzagging. So basically you go zigzag again from right to left and from bottom to top. You, you move your eyes in zigzag until you find the keyword that you need. So you see, you are not reading. You are not reading to understand everything. You are just searching for your keyword. If you cannot find it, but you want to make sure that you've done a good job scanning, you can always restart your zigzag, okay? So starting from the right top corner and moving to the left side, okay? Just like that. Now, another thing that you can do, and this is maybe for more advanced scanners, so once you've practiced, you will probably have the ability to just go through the middle of the paragraph with your eyes from the bottom to top, and somehow your eyes will um, tell you where the keywords are. So you will see them with your peripheral vision, so to speak, uh, around that middle. So you will go... And um, so now I would like us to practice and I will ask you to find some keywords for me. You don't have to tell me where they are. I trust that you find them. All I want you to do is to send R whenever you're ready, whenever you find it. So just to let me know how quickly you work, I want you to just type R when you're ready. And so what we will do, we will scan this text on the left-hand side. So we will imagine that this is our paragraph. And I have a few words for you to find for me. Are you ready? Okay. So the first word I want you to find is understand. And 
another word that I want you to uh, find is shocked. Brilliant. Another word that I want you to find is phrases. Phrases. Beautiful. Another one. Contain. Contain. Your expert scanners, guys. And the last one. Brain. Brain. <laughs> awesome. Well done, everybody. So from now on, I invite you to combine the techniques of skimming and scanning. We will practice it in a second together uh, when doing reading. Okay. You don't read IELTS like you read newspapers. And please don't start by reading the questions. Okay. Even if you know everything about the text from the questions, I think it's a waste of time because you will have to read them again anyway. So um, don't do that. First, you want to skim the text and to find out what it is about. So now your second very favorite question type. Woohoo! True, false, not given. And we will use the scanning technique in order to help us answer these questions. You will also find out about a few secrets of true, false, not given, which I hope will be helpful to you. So here is our first question. Digital libraries could have a more professional image than the Internet. Can you see the question? Wonderful. The first thing I want you to do is to find keywords in this question. And keywords will be the words that will help you locate the answer. Here, I want to say that your keywords will certainly not be digital libraries. The whole text is about digital libraries. So you will expect those things to see, to see them many, many times in the text. So they will not help you find your answer. Okay. Professional is a very good keyword. What else? They are comparing digital libraries to what? Yes. Yes. So basically, in this question, you have a comparison, yes? And they are asking you to um, decide who is more professional, yes? The libraries or the internet, yes? So um, here are the keywords. Now, what I would like you to do is to find the keywords in the paragraph. You have 15 seconds to do that. All you need to do is to type R when you're ready, okay? Here is your paragraph. Find the keywords. Type R when you're ready. You don't have to tell me where they are. Amazing, isn't it? Now, you will read very carefully around the keywords, this area that I highlighted in red, to find your answer. 
So now you tell me if this statement is true, false or not given. You have 30 seconds. Okay. It is true, actually. <laughs> That's okay, Angelo, you're learning. So here um, you are learning a trick. One of the tricks that they use in IELTS, they will use opposite words to confuse you. Again, they are doing that not because they are cheeky and they want to make your life difficult and hell. They are doing that because they want you to prove that you understand what you read. And here we have the same message given to you from a different perspective. So, the first question is about libraries being more professional than the Internet. The text tells you that the Internet may seem amateurish, right? So, here, what I would also like you to see is how grammar is parallel as well. Could as a possibility may as a possibility. So they say in the text that the present internet may seem look amateurish, yes? In retrospect, in comparison. The question tells you that digital libraries could be more professional than the internet, yes? So basically they uh, gave you uh, the same message from a different perspective, the perspective of libraries, the, the perspective of um, the internet, but the message is the same. If the internet is an amateur, then libraries are professional. Can you see that, Angelo, Vino? Yeah. Okay. Yes, there will be more difficult questions, Angelo, which will be based on very advanced vocabulary, but not always, and you can answer those, yes? So keep the faith, okay? And keep going. So this is the the, the, the key, the, the essence of this question, yes? Amateur is opposite of professional, yes? Um, so if the internet is the amateur, digital libraries are professional, yes? So the message is the same. So here I can tell you that uh, the keywords and the whole game of IELTS is actually much easier than you think. Yes, and here you need to realize that questions are translations of the text and the questions are paraphrases of the text. In other words, it's a translation from English to English. Yes, so they say the same using different words. That's why you will always find keywords to help you find that passage in the text that connects it to the question. Always. It always works. 
because questions are paraphrases of the text. They may not be the same words. Yes, you found the internet in both the question and the text, but then you didn't find professional, you found the opposite, amateurish. Yes, so this is how it works in IELTS. You will always find the keywords and so they show you where the paraphrase is in the text and then as you read around the keywords, you will find out what your answer is. So it is magic and it's not. It's very actually a very, very simple thing to do if you know that this is what it is all about. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I have some practice for you. This is a full text and here are your questions. We've answered the first question together. So we have our keywords in the text and keywords in the question and we answered the first question that this is true. Now you have questions two to seven to answer and I'm giving you five minutes. Please write your answers in one line like this. Two, for example, true. Three, for example, false. Four, for example, not given. Uh, five, and so on. Okay, so please send all your answers only when you're ready in one line. Don't write them and send them separately. There are 10 of you here and it will be very difficult for me to check. Okay, so send all your answers in one line when you are ready and you have five minutes. Good luck.
I like how Abdul Jabbar is correcting himself. Nice work. <laughs> okay, let's discuss. So, for the second question, we have many, many keywords. It's a really good paraphrase of the text. We have only experts, permitted, view, <laughs> scanned, and Beowulf. Everything here is a keyword. And in the text, we have Beowulf. Qualified scholars, only qualified scholars, for only experts. Beautiful, thank you for sending me all your answers. We have allowed for permitted, we have see for view, and we have the same word scanned. So we have all our keywords. Now, question two is actually false. Question two is false. Why? You are learning a very important lesson about IELTS true false not given. So listen up. First of all, pay attention to the tense in which the verbs appear in. IELTS is testing your ability not to jump into conclusions. And here, it's something that we people tend to do a lot. We tend to think that if something was true in the past, it is true now. If something is true now, it will be true in the future. Think again. It's not always like this, right? We are lucky if the things are the same, or maybe not. Who knows? But uh, not to get too philosophical about it. We have um, different sentences. Another thing that you need to see here is that the text tells us that qualified scholars were allowed to see the original before the guy from Kentucky scanned it and put it on the internet. So now everyone can see the scanned version on the internet so this makes the statement false. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. So this is the level of detail you pay attention to when doing true false not given. And again, they are not making your life difficult. I think this is one of the most exciting questions in IELTS. Um, the most challenging one and the most exciting one and rewarding if you do it well. You pay attention to detail. Okay, so here the difference in tenses but also notice what it is they are talking about in the text and in the question. No matter how you look at this question, it is false. For the third question, we have woodblock Tokyo and researchers, and you can easily find those uh, keywords in the text. And you look and look and look, and you cannot see anything, right? Because question three is not given. They are talking about the researchers handling the originals, but there is nothing about damage. So again, if you answered true or false, you are making assumptions. Yes, and the text simply doesn't tell us anything about the damage whatsoever. Handle means just um, keep it in your hands. Do something with your hands to it or with it. Yes, but it doesn't say anything about damage. Okay? Is that a yes from everyone? Can you see? Perfect. Now, 
We have question four, fewer staff required in digital libraries. The only thing we have in the text about people working in the libraries is here. Clerks are spared the, sh the chore of reshelving. And to everyone who answered yes to that, true or false, um, actually, most of you answered this correctly. Very well done. It is not given because they are not telling us that people who work in the libraries will lose the jobs just because they don't have to put the books back on the shelves. Yes? So this is your, again, this is your um, proof. Um, nothing about losing jobs. And just because they don't have to put books back on, back on the shelves, doesn't mean that they will lose their jobs. Just think how many assumptions we make in our lives this way. Shocking, huh? <laughs> question five. In question five, we have people may be able to borrow digital materials. We quickly find the corresponding keyword. And again, here, they're working on the brotherhood of words borrow and lend yes so can i borrow from you can you lend me yes so we're talking about the same activity the same um uh, thing to do but from a different perspective of giver and receiver so here uh, that's very easy. Question five is true. Yes, if digital libraries can lend their collections, their digital collections, uh, people can borrow them. Number six. Um, I love question six because it helps me show you how beneficial it is for you to do your skimming. A lot of texts in IELTS are based on those areas that you skim. So when you see keywords in a question like this, you think, ah, it sounds familiar. I have seen it somewhere. Yes. So we have skimmed this, par this part of this paragraph. Yes. At the beginning. And you remember millimeters of space occupy so we went straight there right so it was even quicker for you to find the keywords and you've got them here and you know that this is false because you have meters on the shelves compared to millimeters on the disk yes so digital libraries will occupy more space than uh, ordinary libraries this is false yes it's actually the opposite Question seven is the tricky one again. And here uh, we have the keywords. Also publication, publish. And here this one is not given. And it is not given because, first of all, I want you to pay attention to the tense of the verb again. So in the question, it says that it will fall. In the text, it says it has fallen. Different tense. Then you can say, oh, Emilia, but it says continues to drop. But what? And here we have it very, very clearly that it is the price of disk storage that has fallen and continues to drop. It's not the price of newly published books. Nothing about that in the text. Okay, so this makes the question seven not given. Can everyone see that? Do you have any questions here? Hmm. Angelo, are you still here? Okay. 
it's telling me that you want to go away. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Louis, the question between false and not given. If it's not given, they are not giving you the information. So, for example, you had that with woodblock um, prints in Tokyo. They told you that people were handling them, keeping in their hands, but it didn't say anything about damage. So this is not given. In a question, not have to put books back on the shelves, but they didn't tell us if they lose their jobs or if they keep them. Yes, so there is nothing about it in the text. Very often, they will be about future, like question seven. So, because we really like to make that assumption. If something happened in the past, it is true now. If something is true now, it will happen in the future. So pay attention to the tenses because just because something happened in the past, it doesn't mean that it will happen in the future. And it's their favorite trick in IELTS. Guys, this is their favorite trick to talk about the future. And in the text, you have nothing about the future. So it's showing you how you're assuming things all the time. Yes? Um, false is opposite. So I say white and the text says black. I say more and the text says less. Like for example, um, in question six, yes, li digital libraries will occupy less space, not more. It's completely opposite. Okay, Louis, does it help you? Welcome. I'll wait for your questions to come through before I move on. Most of the questions, yes, Angelo, most of the questions are according to the text, so in order of the text. Some are not. So here I am giving you a technique that will work no matter what. Sometimes they are in order, sometimes not. But what you need is the confidence that scheming and scanning give to you. Yes, if they are not in order, you can still find your answers by using scheming and scanning. Does that make sense, Angelo? Victoria, I think you had a question. Okay. All right, let's move on. This is the formula. So, for matching headings, don't apologize, Victoria, by the way. Uh, for matching headings, first you will skim the text to say hello to the stranger, to calm your brain down, 
to find out how information is distributed in the text. Then you will analyze the example. So you will look at the example. If there is one, you need to find it because you don't want to waste your time answering the question that is already done for you as an example. And if you get it wrong and if you make a mistake there, you will be wasting your time and losing precious points. So please pay attention. See if there is an example. If there is one, cross it out. You have one less heading to worry about and you have one less paragraph to worry about. Huh? Then you will read the first and last line of the first paragraph that you want to find headings for and think what it is about. If you can do it in three words, you're doing a great job. Remember the bigger picture, yes? And as you find that bigger picture, find a heading that conveys the same message. So when you find the, when you think, okay, what is it about? Um, it's very, very, very likely that your three words to describe the paragraph that you come up with will be very close to one of the headings on your list. Okay? For any other question type, you will skim the text first. And you skim the text only once, by the way, at the beginning, yes? To get the bigger picture and to see how information is distributed in the text. Then, you will read one question at a time. One question. IELTS teaches you how to focus on things that are really important. Don't look for keywords for all the questions. Waste of time. You will have to go back to those questions again anyway. So it's better to do one thing but do it well. Okay? So find keywords in that question. Then scan the text to find those keywords in the text. And then read around intensively to find, to decide on your answer. You will repeat steps two to four, yes, until you're done with all the questions. Now, a few words about the reading answer sheet. It's very important. Uh, for my first year of teaching IELTS, I was like doing my best doing the techniques and still my students were not getting there correct scores and then I realized that sometimes they made mistakes with the answer sheet. Silly but happens. And so a few words about this. First of all, um, as you transfer your answers to the answer sheet, please pay attention to the numbers. If you, for example, at the beginning move your answer one line up or one line down, in the answer sheet, you can have all your questions correct, but they will be in incorrect spaces, yes? So please be really careful, okay? Another thing is that you have to answer all your questions, so try to keep to the suggested, suggested types, times. So they say 20 minutes per text. If you think that the first text is, text is easier, spend 15 minutes on the first text, 20 on the second, 25 on the last one. Also, because all of you have to uh, uh, read all three texts to get your score, um, what I suggest you do, you skim and scan at the beginning, and answer the easy questions first. So you go through all three texts and answer easy questions first. Then you uh, do the more difficult questions so you have more time to go back and to think about them. The last five minutes of the test, I would like you to do IELTS Lottery. So if you're not sure, If you are not sure um, if 
you are correct or not. It's better to write something in the space than leave it blank. Okay, Emilia students don't leave empty spaces in their answer sheets. Okay, that applies to both your reading and listening. Okay, please don't ignore them. Okay, so um, um, the last five minutes, any mini money mo, play 50 50, gamble. Yes, it's your IELTS lottery ticket. If you don't buy a lottery ticket, you never win. Right? So here in the test, you they are, they are not giving you uh, bad scores for uh, wrong answers. So please don't leave empty space. Yes, I did, Lorraine. If you still can't see it, that means that um, your um, internet is stuck, maybe. Yes, you do. <laughs> so these are my suggestions for you guys. Spelling is important in IELTS, reading and listening. And there should be no spelling mistakes in your reading test for a very simple reason. All your answers in this test are taken from the text. So if you know, you tend to make mistakes as you copy, please watch yourself and double check. You should have no spelling mistakes in IELTS reading because all your answers come from the text. Is that clear, everybody? Lorraine, can you see now? Cool. Now, Angelo. Angelo, why are you um, raising your hand? What do you want to ask? Um, let's put it this way, Angelo. Um, I was very careful about um, saying what I say uh, before I was really sure that it works. Um, and it does. I have a lot of colleagues, um, IELTS teachers, who say read the questions before you read the text. For example, uh, some of my colleagues, my really good friends, believe that uh, you should read the questions that are before the text. Like as you open the test, yes, and you see, uh, for example, headings before the text, they say this means that you have to read the questions before the text because it comes first. And I find that it's not true. For that very simple reason, you will confuse your brain. I basically worked on this test until I found the quickest, the fastest, the most accurate way of doing it. So now I can tell you that when I did my IELTS test, I did my reading in 40 minutes and I scored 9. So. In 40 minutes, I answered correctly 39 or 40 questions. Okay, so if you want, test it and see if it works for you, okay? Angelo, it's possible that um, you are one of those um, very special people who ha need a different strategy. But all I'm asking you to do is to test different strategies and if they don't work, drop them. What I see happens with my IELTS students, 
They try the same method all over again because somebody on the internet told them or somebody wrote that this is what you need to do. Most of the guys who teach it have never taken the test themselves and have never scored nine consistently. So they are teaching you something that they imagine works, but they have never tried it themselves. Okay, so that's something you would need to consider. And still, you are very welcome to test all the different approaches. Start by reading the questions. And for example, notice how you feel. You read the questions first and your brain goes, <laughs> yeah, skim the text first and your brain goes, ah, now I know, yeah, um, see how it goes, just test things around, yeah, okay, <laughs> indeed, sense, okay, so this is what your answers look like in the answer sheet. They give you numbers and letters so you don't have to write full answers, yes? So you will write IX or VI for your um, headings, A, B or C or F for your multiple choice. You don't have to write full answers. Um, T for true, F for false, etc. Again, you don't have to write full words and don't waste your time doing that, yes? So you're my smart students, you're my smart candidates, it's enough to write T for true or Y for yes, N for no, F for false, and then NG for not given. Uh, when you have numbers, you can write them as digits. So please, and um, that applies especially to listening. If you have answers as a numbers, don't write them as words. You can write them as digits. It's brilliant for dates, yes? And you always have a date. No, actually not, Victoria. Yeah, that's great news, isn't it? Okay, before we do writing, I would like you to take a five minute break. So I will see you at 7.38, yes? Run to the toilet, make yourself another cup of tea. I will see you at 7.38. Bye-bye. See you soon.
Are you there? Woo, everyone ready? Good break? So a quick check-in, how are you feeling after reading? <laughs> Guys, this needs to be practiced, but uh, it really works. Um, last week I was teaching a native speaker how to read for IELTS. And he got so excited, he agreed with me that it's more exciting that, than doing Sudoku. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like you... Yeah, it's like you see the whole text in a completely different light, you know, you read in a different way, everything makes sense. It's beautiful. Um, you know, um, I was learning Spanish, well, yeah, I, I speak Spanish a little bit as well, and when I went to learn Spanish in Spain, uh, we had a reading class and I answered all the questions in five minutes and then go, went to the toilet. I came back and everyone looked at me like I was, I don't know, um, Michael Jackson or something. And they said like, <gasps> you finished and we looked at your notebook and you answered all the questions correctly. How did that happen? <laughs> and I was like, mm, I know a few tricks. So um, I can tell you that it also <laughs> works in other languages. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So um, keep practicing. Uh, you will see the rewards very, very quickly. I think that simply after this class, you can improve your score by at least half a band, if not more, because you will do your headings and your true false not given much better. Um, you will apply the same skimming and scanning technique to other questions. It's, 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 um, it's amazing. Okay. So now let's do writing. And, um, we will have a slightly different way of working with writing together. And first I will give you a few general pieces of information in terms of, um, the test, how it's organized, the criteria so that you know what to expect and also what is expected of you. So um, for the writing test, you have 60 minutes and in those 60 minutes, you need to do both tasks one and two. Uh, task one is writing a report about a graph table chart or diagram you have to write at least 150 words and you have about 20 minutes to do it. Task two is 250 word essay and you have about 40 minutes to do it. And you need to know that you should try both tasks, one and two, they actually tell you that in the exam. Um, and that you should spend more time on task two because it's worth more marks. Task two is more expensive. Okay, how does it work? So if you get uh, band seven for task two and band 6.5 for task one, you will still get band seven for your writing. Unfortunately, the same works in the opposite way. So if you get band 7 for task 1, but only band 6.5 for task 2, you will get 6.5. So it is really a good idea to invest your time and effort in task 2. However, you cannot forget about task 1. So here I have another advice. If you are doing task 1 first, you cannot go over 25 minutes you must have at least 35 to do your task too well. If you start with task two, 
please don't go over 45 minutes because you still have to have a decent task one. Okay? Um, so if you start with task two, no more than 45 minutes. If you start with task one, no more than 25 minutes altogether so that you have enough time for the other task. Um, For writing as well as speaking, you must remember that you have to use your own ideas and your own words. So don't try to memorize anything from the internet. I know it's really hard not to look at perfect answers band 9 for IELTS so that you know how to write a good essay. Um, but it's really not a good idea. And uh, in a few slides, you will find out also about the things that you should not be doing um, uh, because of that and how to actually take your writing to the next level. So to show the examiner that you're not an average um, candidate, band five or six, and that you are much uh, well, well above it. And that would be band seven, eight or nine. So, um, you don't have paper for making notes, but as you open the booklet, um, you will have enough space uh, below task one or below task two to write your answers there. So, and, or your plan. So, uh, not your answers, your plan. So please do that. Um, it will be actually a good idea to have your question and your plan in the same space because this will help you focus more. So it's a perfect space for your plan. You don't have time for a rough copy. Now, before uh, we move on, I would like you to prepare a piece of paper and I would like you to find an A4 piece of paper um, and we will do a little dictation together. Okay, so please get ready and tell me when you're ready. Everyone get a piece of paper and a pen, we're doing dictation. Two, four, six. A few more people need to tell me. Okay, so I will do the dictation. And um, I will read, uh, it's a short text, so please don't worry. And when I'm done, I will read it again, all of it, so that you can check and correct. So if you miss a word or two, don't panic, you will listen again. All right, you cannot afford to waste your time. You cannot afford to waste your time. Count every word. And count every word in the text you have written.
and count every word you have written. And count every word in the text you have written. It is good to know It is good to know how many words you write How many words you write per line approximately Per line approximately. All you need. All you need is to multiply this number is to multiply this number by the number of lines by the number of lines To give you a rough figure, to give you a rough figure, I will repeat everything now so you can correct or complete the text. You cannot afford to waste your time and count every word in the text you have written. It is good to know how many words you write per line approximately. All you need is to multiply this number by the number of lines to give you a rough figure. So now uh, do as you're told and take a line somewhere from the middle and count the words in that line. The first line is too pretty, the last line is too messy. So take one line from the middle, count how many words you have there and then multiply this by the number of lines and give me the number. So for example, it will be um, seven um, or let's say nine um times um six okay something like that um and how much is that so give me the the calculation thank you angelo beautiful Great. Guys, what you have in front of you is precisely 50 words. Okay? So have a look at the text now. The text in front of you is precisely 50 words. So now think about it this way. 
If you need to write task one, uh, if you need to write task one, you need three blocks of text like this. Add an extra line and you are done. If you need 250 words for task two, you write five blocks of text like this, add an extra line or two, and you are done. So I think what this exercise does, first of all, you find out that you don't have to waste your time and count all the words, dup, 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 dup. Uh, but also that the volume that is required, the volume of the text that they want you to write is much lower than what you think. In other words, you don't have to write a book in IELTS. Okay, a lot of people just write, oh my God, how much more? I have to write more, I have to write more. Um, when will this end? Oh my God, oh my God, what do I write? But if you think about it, you actually don't have to write that much, yes? So, um, that's something that you need to pay attention to. You don't have to write a lot. So, my recommendation is between 160 and 180 words for task one. And 260, 280 words for task two. Not more than that. Okay? Um, simply because you don't have time to write more. And I want you to concentrate on quality, not quantity. Okay? So the whole idea is to give a good text. You don't have to write plenty but it needs to be good. My students sometimes write essays which are 600 words long. I don't know how they do that, but they do. And they're rubbish. Yeah? So please don't do that yourselves. You need to pay attention to the quality of your writing. Okay? Um... So, before you do the, do the test, it's also a good idea to know the criteria. I don't know if you know about it, but these are available online for everybody to see. IELTS will not tell you, oh, by the way, check your criteria, um, but they are available online. So, um, there are four criteria for writing. The first one is task response or task achievement. This is basically about how well you answer the question. So if the question in your essay is about advantages and disadvantages, you don't write about um, people saying this and saying people, other people saying that. If they ask you to write whether you agree or disagree, you don't write about advantages and disadvantages, okay? In your report, that means that you select information, that you don't write like crazy about everything you see, okay? You have to see the main trends and you need to just select the most important things to write about. Um, in your essay, this will mean that you need to present your opinion, your position, very clearly and support it with ideas. Coherence and cohesion, those two magic words, mean the flow of the text and how logical it is. So you need to organize information um, logically so that it's easy to follow and to understand and you will connect ideas together and sentences together. You will also use paragraphs. So you will organize information. Mm -hmm. Lexical resource is your vocabulary. So this is the words and how you use them. Here, 
the magic word is variety. You guys need to realize that your English is so good that you should not be repeating any words. Okay? Your English is so good you should not be repeating anything. The same for your grammar. You should not be repeating sentence structure, the same sentence structure in every sentence. Okay? So they want variety from you and you can easily give it. Just don't allow your brain to go easy. Don't allow your brain to, um, to go for the things that feel safe. If you, if you play it safe, uh, you will uh, go way beyond your actual level. I'm back. It's not co your computer crashing. <laughs> um, so this is something that you need to see here. You are playing a very important game, right? IELTS is important. And in order to get you high score, most of you guys want band 7 or 7.5. Yes? That means that you need to go beyond ordinary. You need to go beyond average. You need to show that you are advanced learners of English. Band 7 is advanced level of English. If you go to language school, it's not intermediate. It's not upper intermediate anymore. It's advanced. Okay? So the difference between band 6 and band 7 is huge. And that's a difference of one whole level. You need to show your examiner that your English is smashing good, okay? So to do that, you have to take risks. You have to show off with your English. You can never repeat anything. Your English is so good that you will not repeat a single word in your essay. Take that in. Your English is this good. I know that. And you should know too, okay? So, what do we do with our writing now? This is your time management for task two. And again, you may disagree, you may try something different, but I have some concrete uh, evidence that this works. In the first three, four minutes of the test, you will read the task and you will analyze it and you will plan your answer. If you still think that good writers are geniuses, just geniuses, they are geniuses, but they also work hard. You know that already. Genius is not enough. Never anybody has... <laughs> in the whole history of the world. Um, maybe a few things happened this way that they were amazing the first time and they still needed some work and some corrections. And I can tell you that all those Nobel Prize winners and amazing writers and journalists, nobody writes without a plan. Okay? So you need to plan as well. When you plan, you take care of the first two criteria, task response and cohesion and coherence. Because if you take time to plan your answer, you're making sure that your text makes sense and that you really answer the question and fully, that you present your opinion and you support your opinion with arguments. So these are the first two criteria because if you know what you're writing, you have your plan, your essay has a great chance to be very logical and organized. 
Yes? It will be easy to follow and to understand. Then you write. So you have about 32, 34 minutes to write your essay, which is plenty. Yes? Remember, it's just those five blocks of text that you don't have to write much. So you write following your plan and you keep your eye on the task all the time to make sure that you don't go astray. In the last three, four minutes of the test, you will read through everything you have written and carefully check for repetition, which you should avoid. Um, and all the silly mistakes. When I did my test, I made, um, I found, maybe I made more mistakes, but I found uh, three mistakes in task one and four mistakes in task two. Okay? Um, everyone makes mistakes, not because we are stupid, not because our English is not good enough. We make mistakes because our hand is not as fast as our brain. We make mistakes because we are tired. Um, you get up at sometimes 4, 5, 6 a.m. to get to the IELTS test center. Uh, writing is the third of the writing tests, yes, after listening and reading. You are exhausted, right? You're stressed. Uh, all you can think about is toilet, food, and sleep, yes? Um, so it's very natural that your you will be your hand will play play tricks on you. You have to check your writing. Okay, so um, this is the key to your success because if you check your writing before the end of the test, you have a chance to improve your grammar and vocabulary scores. Yes. So, by planning and organizing your text before you start, you are taking care of the first two criteria, task achievement and cohesion and coherence, the first two. By checking and correcting, you are improving your um, grammar and vocabulary score. I can tell you, as an experienced teacher, I always know when my students give me their writing without checking. I always know. Okay? I always know. Okay? So, um, don't let that happen to you in the IELTS test and check and correct, alright? So now, Here's our task. Please have a look and tell me, do you agree, disagree or both? Mm -hmm. So you basically guys think that people are horrible, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so here I will be challenging you a little bit. And first, let's have a look at the structure of the task so that you're clear what's happening here. Each IELTS task has three parts to it. Background, opinion and question. Here, the first one, the first sentence is a background and very often um, you have it separate from the opinion, sometimes they are merged together. Now, background, this sentence as you read it, it gives you a very good idea of the context for your essay. It's very important because as you read it, 
in your mind's eye, you see some kind of a picture, some image. And that's very important because this is how you activate the language and the knowledge you have on the topic. So um, here you have, this is my image. When I read this sentence, this is what I see, that people have more and more and more and more stuff. The second question is usually what I call an opinion. It is an opinion and its main function is to evoke a reaction in you. This opinion is usually very controversial and it's controversial on purpose to stimulate your writing, to stimulate you and to help you write, to respond to it. So here it's about um, giving you a reason to write. Now, as you read this opinion sentence, what you need to do is to carefully observe yourself and your reaction to it. Because as you do, you realize what your opinion is. And I want you to be as honest with yourself as you can. You don't have to just agree and just disagree. And actually, it's a good idea to be both. Okay, partially agree, partially disagree. So, Angelo, um, we agree here. <laughs> I will show you how it works in a few slides. So, the third part is the question. And this is the instruction that you need to follow. So, it's something very important because that question um, actually determines the shape of your essay. So here they say, do you agree or disagree? They don't say about advantages or disadvantages, right? They don't ask you to discuss both views and give your own opinion. Here they want you to tell them why you agree or disagree, yes? And that's the most important thing about it. This is the instruction. It will shape your whole essay. So, um, I do this in greater detail during my master classes, but here I want to show you how introduction can be written for high level students, band seven, eight, or nine. And it's very important again to understand that you will never be able to write a good introduction if you don't have a plan first. So first you need to know what you want to write about. First you need to have your plan before you start writing the essay. So here, this is my plan. My first argument to agree, I will say yes, of course. People work more to have more and they forget about their family and friends. Horrible. I will say in my second argument, sometimes they still steal and kill to have more money or more things. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Well, on the other hand, if I look around, I look at my family, look at my neighbors and my friends, I realize that most of them are really good people and uh, they are working to support their families to have a decent life and to spend quality time together. If I switch off the TV, I also know that most people want to have a beautiful and happy life. They help each other, set up communities, and work together for common good. So these are my arguments to agree and disagree. Now, if you have a careful look, they are together, yes? So A1 and D1 are about family, 
to agree and to disagree. And then A2 and D2 are about society. Yes? To agree and to disagree. So now, to write an introduction, you actually need just two sentences. The first sentence is a paraphrase of your task from the essay card. Okay, so from the, from the rubric. So here I wrote in my own words, more than ever before, uh, people are concerned with owning commodities and it seems that they forget about being kind towards others. This is, let's say, the paraphrase of the task, yes? So saying what the task says in my own words. What follows is the most important sentence to the whole essay. And you know from our reading class how important introduction is. Introduction tells your reader what they are going to read about in the whole essay. So you need to give it to them. So instead of writing, I will discuss both views and give my own opinion. Or in the following essay, I will present my opinion and say and give arguments to why I disagree. Total bullshit, guys. This is the kind of introduction. And don't be offended if you do that yourself. Simply, you don't know about it. This is the kind of introduction that will not give you a higher score than band six. You are not using your own words, first of all. 60% of essays that I mark for my students in IELTS classes start like that before they start studying with me, okay? So what do we do instead? Instead, we write what is called a thesis statement. And the thesis statement is the most important sentence of your essay because it gives your reader the idea of your opinion and how you're going to map the whole essay. So here we have, while we can be concerned about the effect of that on the family unit, paragraph A1, and growing crime rates, Paragraph A2, most of us work just to have a decent life, argument D1, while doing everything we can to support our communities, paragraph D2. So have a look. In that one sentence, I described for my reader the whole essay, how I am going to write about it. My whole plan is in that one sentence. So now, if somebody wants just to skim it, because they are lazy or they don't have time to read my whole essay, they should know what my whole essay will be about, just from here. Yes? Can you see that? So, what follows will be two paragraphs. In the first paragraph, my topic will be family, and I will co include in that paragraph argument A1 and D1. Yes, they are about family. In paragraph two, I will write about society, and I will include arguments A2 and D2 and develop them further to make my answer full, yes, and complete. Do you have any questions? Oops. Oh. Too much light now. So you can see that it's it's new idea. So you know it's obviously a little bit. <laughs> um, I will do both, agree and disagree. 
So you see, I agree and disagree in my introduction. I agree and disagree in my first paragraph. I agree and disagree in the second paragraph. Basically, what I'm saying is this. I know that some people are naughty, but there are a lot of good people in this world. Yes, can you see it? What I, why I am uh, encouraging you to do this is because um, it's easier to plan an essay like this. It takes less time because um, you can quickly find the counter argument. You know, you have probably um, a friend who always disagrees with you. Yes? It's, there's always somebody who will. So, you know, like to, to fill your essay with ideas, you can just come up with one argument and then think, oh, what would my neighbor say? The one who always disagrees with me. Um, so it's quicker to, to, to plan it. And then your essay is more dynamic. It's more colorful as you write like this because there is more going on. You have contrast between those ideas. Victoria, you can, but just listen to what I am saying now. V not listen to what I am saying now. I am taking you to the next level. If you combine agree and disagree within one paragraph, you give them one topic, like I did here. One is family, second is society. You will have a more dynamic essay because you will have contrast to describe in it. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, but it's a really good idea because it will give you and, you know, more uh, movement, yes, in your essay. It will be easier for you to write about it. It is very strategic indeed. It does, because contrast is what works. You know, if you get from life the things that you want all the time and you only meet people that you like, it's boring <laughs> a little bit, right? You need some uh, entertainment and entertainment and um, dynamics come from contrast, yes? You have winter, you have summer, yes? You you say, this is white. Your neighbor will say, no, this is black, yes? This is where, this is where all the juice comes from, okay? So um, if you don't feel confident doing that, leave it. It's still okay to write one paragraph to agree, another paragraph to disagree. Yes, Victoria, the same way. Sometimes you have an essay which says um, causes and solutions, like what causes global warming, what solutions can you get? So the easiest thing will be to come up with causes for global warming and for each of the causes to give solutions. It's a beautiful essay to write and so easy, yes? Abdul-Jabbar, you simply see that it's not black or white. So, you know, I can see that there are some people who commit crimes, but I am not a murderer and a thief, and my friends are not, and my neighbors are not. If that makes sense. Just because we have Mr. Trump as president doesn't mean that all Americans are stupid to give you a very drastic example, right? So, um, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so you don't have to. If you, if you truly and genuinely just agree, that's okay. But please be careful because what I see my students do, oh, they say, oh, I agree fully and completely. Halfway through the essay, they start writing about opposite argument. Huh. So maybe it's better to admit that you see both sides of the argument straight away and then play it to your advantage. Exactly. You know that not all the people are bad, right? It's like to say that everyone is wrong and everyone is a thief and murderer apart from you for this, uh, for this essay. So what I'm saying is that the closer you are to how you really feel about it, it will be easier to write as well. Okay? This is really good source, guys. This is where, you know, from my experience, again, if I mark uh, essays from my, for my students in IELTS classes, they um, somehow those essays that are balanced, you know, agree and disagree, get better scores. Simply because of that, it's a strategic move. You have more color, more contrast. Why, uh, uh, Louis, what's happening? Why would you like us to look at the criteria now? First of all, you need to also remember that um, you can completely disagree with the examiner. You, the, what your opinion is and what their opinion is doesn't matter. Yes, so you and I can disagree completely, but if you present your opinion and you give it nice arguments, that's all that matters. It's the presentation and, and the arguments. It's not whether I agree with you or not. Okay, so if that was so, it would be a very tricky test to do because different examiners have different opinions. Or imagine that IELTS would have to send to all examiners, this is the opinion that we support. All other op opinions are wrong. Yes? It would be like, I don't know, Northern Korea or something. You, you, you cannot imagine the, it would be a complete mess. So it's not about whether you agree or disagree with the examiner, okay? Yes, it's about how you present it, how you present your arguments, the language, the structure, the organization. It's not about your opinion, Lauren, okay? So it's not the content of the opinion that matters, it's just that you have one, if that makes sense. Okay? Great. Here are a few uh, phrases that um, I suggest you use when connecting ideas and sentences together. Okay, have a look quickly. I will pause myself.
second. Okay, I'm back. Somebody got kicked out as well. <laughs> um, okay, so here are the expressions that I would like you to use to connect ideas and sentences together. This is how you make it work in terms of connection. And this is how you make your essay flow. This is how you help your reader make sense out of it. Most of all, you help yourself start sentences nicely and sound like a proper IELTS candidate, yes? And please don't copy anything. You don't have to take screenshots with my silly face. Um, I will send them to you by email tonight after we finish the class, so you don't have to do anything, okay? So um, this is to show you how you can manipulate with your argument using those beautiful phrases so that you can tell the reader what it is that you think, yes? To introduce your ideas, introduce uh, new concepts, uh, start new sentences. It's brilliant how it works. Now, for task one, we have a similar game when it comes to time management. So, um, first you will spend about three, four minutes planning. Um, you will look at the graph, table, chart and diagram to analyze it and then you will write. So because you don't have to write a lot, remember three blocks of text, it will be a piece of cake really, only if you analyze what you want to write first. If you still think that you can plan and write at the same time, I would like you to stop that. Okay, this refers to both task one and task two. It's impossible. Okay, multitasking is a myth, especially in IELTS. Don't multitask. First think what you want to write and then you will think how to do it, but never these two at the same time. Okay, so again, as you write, you think how to include all the points from your plan. Okay, then read through your text the last three, four minutes and check and correct for repetition and all the silly mistakes that you made because you're tired, blah, 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 blah. Yes, so the same, exactly the same way to organize yourself when you write. This time you have 20 minutes, yes, but you have only 150 words to write which is three little blocks of text, yes? So, now let's, let's have a look. First of all, there are a few do's and don'ts, things that you have to do and you shouldn't do no matter what in IELTS. So first, you need to write a sentence describing what you see in the graph. And you cannot copy that description from the rubric. So again, what you have in the plan, you need to paraphrase. So just like you have a background in your essay, that first sentence to tell your reader what the situation is, the same happens here in your report. You give them that background information. This is the numbers we're dealing with. These are the numbers. This is the situation. This is the time. These are the things we're analyzing. Next, I would like you to write an overview. So you're capturing the main trends in the graph. Again, the overview, I suggest you write it at the beginning. So after that first description sentence, you write your overview. Again, think about your reader. They want to skim quickly and to see what's going to happen in your report. So if they read those first two sentences, they will know everything and they will not have to go into details if they don't want to. Um, support your statement with data. Basically, every sentence you write in your report has to be backed up by numbers from the graph. So if you say the numbers uh, of employees in this company uh, doubles over the uh, doubled over the years. 
I still don't know how much they are. Yes, yeah? so you need to give us numbers. Never interpret anything. You are not asked to tell the examiner why you think things happened that way. You just describing what you see for them. You leave the interpretation for later, some kind of later. But you, it's none of your business. Again, it would be silly uh, to make interpretations because again, examiners will need would need to get a recommendation for interpretation. Yes. So you never uh, uh, write why things happen that way. And always use numbers to support yourself. Yes. Use paragraphs. Organize. Use linking words. Don't repeat them. And don't repeat the same sentence structure. Stick to the word. Stick to the word limit. And don't get lost in detail. Okay. So it's very important for you to keep these in mind. These are. I think what I would call task one basics, okay? If you want to make sure you have a higher score, a decent score. So here is our graph, have a quick look and we'll analyze it uh, together. Okay. So this is our description sentence. This graph shows how obesity levels have increased in England since 1994. So here we know what happened, where, and when. Yes? Very quick, brief description. The second thing we write is our overview. So here in the overview, we give somebody a very good idea of what happened without going into details and yet being quite specific. So there is a belief uh, amongst IELTS students that overview um, can be general. No. Overview is actually quite specific. It's not detailed, but it is specific. So it gives you specific information about what's happening in the graph. So here we have clearly figures have doubled over this period, reaching a current high level around 30% for both male and female adults. Yes? Boom. How do you write a good overview? For example, in the case of this line graph, as well as all other things in IELTS uh, academic, you look at the beginning of the period and the end of the period, and then comment on the scale of changes. For example, uh, numbers have doubled or tripled or um, um, plummeted by half or whatever, right? You are basically um, just seeing how much things changed over the period, yes? So you're commenting on that difference, yes? It's very easy to do. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you make it complicated, it will be. You want it easy? It will be. So how will you group information? I have two options for you. And I would like you to tell me which option will give you a higher score. Both are okay, but which will give you a higher score? With one paragraph about women, one paragraph about men, or one paragraph about 1994 to 2004, and then 2004 to the present moment. <laughs> which is likely to give you a higher score. They're both correct. Mm -hmm. 
It is the second one, guys. <laughs> because in the second option, you have more contrast. You can compare men to women as well as men and women at the beginning and end of that mini period between 1994 and 2004, for example, and then from 2004 to the present moment. If you just write about women, it will be very, very difficult for you to connect ideas. It will be boring and horrible if you need to just go along the line or you will try to complicate it to make it more interesting and you can get into trouble. So it is more beneficial for you to, um, to look for any logic inside the graph and find something that is not immediately obvious. Usually the immediately obvious is simple by its looks, but then you get into trouble because it's like, uh, uh, uh. and if you um, find that logic behind the numbers, and there always is, you always have two big trends. You always have two big periods. There is always something going on. If you find it, your task one academic is a piece of cake. Can you see that, guys? Victoria, Louis, Lynn. So you can go for option one, but it will not give you contrast. Yes, it's just like. Like in with with your essays, just like with task two, you need that contrast to help you make it more um, dynamic, more interesting. It will be easier to write about it because you will have that contrast. And here it's also super clear that in the first paragraph you're writing about that period where they had more obese men than women, and then in the second paragraph it was the other way round. Yes, there were more obese men than women in the second period. So you have a nice organization, a nice way to divide it, and also you have that contrast that will allow you to, to write better. Can you see that? So this is what your report will look like. So you have the introduction, then you have the overview, and then you have the two paragraphs. No, Victoria, there is nothing about children. <laughs> where did you have, did you, where did you get children from? <laughs> you would do the same. You would do the same, Victoria. There will be, there would be more contrast to play with. Okay? You will get the takeaway, guys. No conclusion. Not required. You have a beautiful overview. Just this. Conclusion is very tricky for Task 1 Academic because if you think conclusion, you want to start writing uh, explanations, yes? Oh, and it will continue like this in the future, or it's because they eat a lot of fish and chips and beans on toast. Who said that? <laughs> yes? So, um, avoid conclusion in task one. You have a very strong overview at the beginning. Why do I say right overview at the beginning? It's a, again, strategic move. If you run out of time, 
you will not have an overview at all if you leave it as last, as a conclusion. If you have very little time, your conclusion or overview will be rubbish. Yes, skip a line. We will talk about it in two slides. So uh, to finish with task one, I want to show you an example how you can um, play with sentence structure, not only vocabulary, to help you write better. So have a look here. I wrote the same message using different words and different sentence structure. <laughs> Angelo, um, process happens like very rarely. So there is a chance I will be talking about the process next week on Thursday. When is your test, Angelo? Oh, not good. Not this Thursday. Yeah, I will be talking about uh, task one in more detail next week. Process, have a look. Um, it's not very complicated. slides for writing. So guys, you're doing academic. So there are a few things that you need to know. Now you know that you will not start your essay with nowadays. 50% of candidates start their essays with nowadays. Okay. And if you really have to use this word, please, um, please remember that it's one word, not three words with two dashes. Stick to your topic when planning and then when writing, just a reminder. And avoid informal language. Informal language are, for example, contracted forms like don't, I'm, can't. Uh, text messaging forms. Until the Queen says otherwise. You is a three-letter word, Y-O-U. I is always capital. And is a word, not a symbol. Don't use gonna, wanna. Okay, this is the language of songs and the streets, but not the IELTS test, especially academic. Um, please be careful with your vocabulary. If you call my children kids, I will be offended. Okay, um, this is an informal word. Stuff is things, objects, equipment, tools. Uh, things but not stuff okay um, don't abbreviate words if you are abbreviating words because it's annoying you because it's too long maybe you're repeating it too often okay so please bear this in mind and as uh, we not asked will the best way to show your paragraphs is to line to leave a line between them Okay, so please leave a line between your paragraphs to show where they begin and end. Remember that paragraphs are a um, visual representation of the logical in in organization of your text. This is how you show where your paragraphs end and begin. Now, I will spend about five minutes talking about speaking test and then about five minutes about listening test. So <laughs> now I need to speed up. So for speaking, the most important thing you need to know is that you need to show off. Just like you, I explained that for your writing test. You don't repeat anything and you show the full variety of your English to the examiner. So first of all, relax because there's nothing worse than having to talk to somebody who is stressed. So imagine your examiner is someone nice. Um, 
I think most examiners are at least as nice as I am. I know quite a few and they are lovely English teachers who have passion for English. And because they have passion for the language, they love people too. They like to talk to you. So just talk to them, okay? The more relaxed you are, the better you speak. Keep eye contact. You're not talking to the wall. You're talking to the person right in front of you. Don't memorize anything. And ask for clarification. If you don't understand something, ask the examiner. It's an element of natural human communication. Yes? When you speak Italian or Spanish or Russian with your friends in your language, with your family, you say at least twice a day, what, what did you say? Can you repeat that? Yes? So, um, you know, don't avoid that in English. It, 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 I think we're scared to ask for clarification because we think that somebody will say, oh, your English is not good enough if you're asking me to repeat or to clarify. It's not true, okay? Um, if you don't have the knowledge of something, it's okay. You can speculate, you can lie. Basically, IELTS examiners are not lie detectors. It's about you speaking English, not saying the truth. If uh, it's not about you remembering the name of the actor who was in the movie, it's about you speaking English, okay? Um, the speaking criteria are similar to those for writing, especially for grammar and vocabulary. What's different is pronunciation and fluency and coherence. So pronunciation, one thing you need to remember, your accent has a minimal effect on the score. Okay, so don't worry about your accent and don't make it into a victim, okay? Don't blame your accent for anything. You can't. Fluency and coherence is the flow of your speech. So here, you can't speak too fast, you can't speak too slow, just speak naturally. Avoid making thinking noises. Uh, mm, uh, mm, mm. Don't repeat words like basically uh, every single sentence or like, you know, like Americans do. I was like and like and like, you know, uh, it's horribly annoying to listen to. And obviously it tells the examiner that you are looking for words, yes, and that you don't have good vocabulary. It's okay, whichever accent you speak with, okay, Louis? Connect your ideas and sentences together. Here is an example. Please tell me which answer A, B or C um, will give you the highest score. Um, in Jeff, no, no, Victoria, it's very simple here. It's answer C. Answer A would give you band one or two score. Answer B would give you uh, band four or three. In answer B, all your vocabulary is basic. This is the vocabulary that people learn in the first month of their study of English. There is nothing amazing about it. Can you see that? Okay. The longest word here is because. Can you see that? B is not the best idea. 
C is a little bit too long, but I wanted to show you a sample where you have different tenses, different verbs, adjectives and adverbs. This is where you are showing off with your English. Can you see that? Okay. So, in part one, uh, it was very good to tell to say Victoria depends which question it is, which part of the test. However, it's not as simple as that, as you have already explained. So in part one, as in every part of the test, the examiner will ask you different questions and different questions are inviting you to use different vocabulary and different grammar. So I think the best strategy is to answer a question in three, four sentences and then shut up. Give the examiner a chance to ask you more questions because this is how you give yourself a chance. If you keep waffling on, on one question, they will never have a chance to, they will try actually, they will interrupt you. And then you will be annoyed, why are you interrupting me? They are actually trying to help you. Because every question in IELTS is about something else. And so every question invites you to talk about something else which means that every question is helping you get a better score because you will be showing off with your English, okay? So another thing that is very important is for you to connect ideas so that you don't repeat yourself. I need to learn English because it is very important for me and it will help me to get an interesting job if I want to work in the tourist industry. Instead of sounding like a robot, I need to learn English. English is very important for me. English will help me to get an interesting job. Can you see the difference? So uh, you will get this exercise in the email. Part two, it's the same rule. Every question is about something else. Which means it's a really good idea to follow the plan and to use it to help you organize. If you have four questions to talk about in two minutes, that means you have 30 seconds per question. Yes? So, again, you don't have to say a lot on each one of them, but you create, a, you have a lot of variety in what you say. And this is really important. Every question on your card is about something else. Okay? Um, very important, don't repeat anything and don't repeat the question to the examiner. The examiner knows what question they asked you. So instead of repeating, you asked me to describe the most memorable place I have ever lived in. I'm like, oh God, um, I know the question. Why are you telling me this again? You can say something like, I've lived in quite a few places, but one place I particularly liked was my tree house in Hawaii. I will tell you about that. I've only ever lived in a tree house in Canada, so I will talk about that. Completely different thing, right? In part three, you will be discussing the topic in general and abstract terms. So if our question in part two was about the most memorable place you've ever lived in, the discussion most probably will be about housing. Housing in your country, housing for young people, housing in the past, housing in the future, uh, housing and technology. 
Okay, so um, this is how it will work in part three. And again, answer each question in four or five sentences and shut up. Give the examiner a chance to un ask you another question. This is how you give yourself a chance, yes, to get a higher score. Don't tell examiner um, how well, don't tell examiners what score you need and um, don't ask them. Don't ask them, don't tell them what score you need and don't ask them how it went. They will not tell you and it will be a very uncomfortable moment for you. So don't do that. Okay. Now for listening, I have five tips for you before we say goodbye. So I need another five minutes of your time. Um, so in 30 minutes, it's the first test of the day. Um, you listen and then you have 10 minutes to transfer, transfer your answers and you have 40 questions to answer. How does it happen? And why do we read questions and instructions? So first, the most important thing is for you to follow the instructions. The test is in constructed in order to help you. So don't try to be smarter than IELTS. A lot of candidates uh, read questions for part four, section four, when they are supposed to be reading questions for part one. This is the easiest part. And most advanced candidates make mistakes there because they thought they were cheeky reading questions for section four. Okay, please follow the instructions. They are there to help you. So when they tell you section three, you have questions 21 to 30, but then they say, first read questions 21 to 26. You don't have to read all of it. Read the questions they tell you to. Why? Because there is a lot that you can learn and prepare yourself for instead of rushing ahead. You will not remember later. You will not remember anything from section four if you read your questions when you're supposed to be reading questions for section one. Okay. So that's a very, very important advice. Why? So if you read your questions, there are a lot of things you can concentrate on. First of all, you need to understand what they want you to do. So here you have, you write no more than two words for each answer. So would this be correct, guys? Is this correct? No, because we have one extra word, yes? So please remember my three monkeys and check how many words you la write for your answer. This also applies to your reading test, right? Very, very careful with those. Another thing you do as you read your uh, questions before you start listening, you can predict their work could be delayed by the something or someone, monkeys or the weather. Before they go to the beach, they need to visit the monkeys or the zoo, something or someone, yes? You can predict a lot. You just need to pay attention. And you pay attention by reading instructions and questions carefully. Remember to use your skimming and scanning skills as you read questions, especially for section four. Another tip I have for you, mind the gap. So you have to pay attention to what is immediately before and after the gap so that you don't repeat anything. Would this be correct? No. Because we have one word that's already there, yes? Be very careful. This is how you lose very, very silly points in IELTS listening, guys. 
Another thing is, when you have to write a longer word or phrase, why don't you write the first letters of it? You will complete it. So in after each section is played, they give you 30 seconds to check and correct your answers. This is how you do it. Because the most important thing really for you is to find your answer. The secondary thing is how to do it. Yes, so it's important to catch your answer and then you can correct and check the spelling and think how to write it down. Okay? So this is my last tip for the listening. I will be sending you an email later tonight and I will send it late so that you don't do any work tonight because it's too late, guys. Um, I wish you all the best with your tests. Good luck. Please tell me how you're feeling about the test. Is it, are you more confident? Do you find it easier? How are you feeling? I know you're tired. I hope you're tired. <laughs> um, if you're not tired, then I didn't do a good job, I think. <laughs> um, so, um, please get in touch uh, after the test and tell me how it went. Um, you're my IELTS babies now, so let me know. <laughs> And um, good luck with your test. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I'll send you the email tonight so you get your um, ideas. Mm, yes, we not. Um, most of the IELTS candidates concentrate on reading and writing, and we had only three hours, so um, you will get a lot of good advice in the email and a lot of practice. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, so good luck, guys. Good night. Have a good rest, and uh, please get in touch after the test, okay? Let me know how it went. Okay, good luck everybody. Thank you for all your hard work. You were amazing. Really strong group you are. <laughs>